In a figurative sense, mm. that phrase exists in English since, when was it? In the 14th century, mm. when I did my research, it first became known in the English and it is also in, in, in the belle, I'm sure mm. you know. Yeah. Kick the dog until the owner or the master comes out. Mm. Come I will lenja. never, never in my life. Cover <laughs> eh? lenja. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> there you go. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another special edition of Podcast and Chill. Today we are chilling with Mr. Carl Niehaus. Welcome, sir. Thank you. You know, I always get scared when someone calls me Mr. Why? In the ANC, when they call you Mr., you know they're going to expel you from the organization. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on the edge. Yeah. Right? They all the time go for me. Yeah. So when you say Mr., I thought, what do you know? You know something I don't know. <laughs> yes, a bit of trauma there. Eh? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, but don't they call you comrade? Do they call you comrade? They still call me comrade. Oh, nice, man. So let's hope they continue to call me comrade. Eh? When last did you check out your bio? When last? Yeah. yeah. Uh, not so long ago. What, what did it say? Do you remember? I think it said something that um, MK, MBA, NEC member, member of the African National Congress, something yeah. like that. Yeah, it says... It depends uh, on which bio you went yeah. to look at. There are many of them around. This one's from Wikipedia. It says, Mr. Carl Niehaus is a former spokesperson for South African ruling mm -hmm. party, uh, the African National Congress, former spokesperson and spokesman for Nelson Mandela, and was a political prisoner after being convicted for treason against South Africa's former apartheid government. All of that is true. Yeah. I was a bit worried because at one stage in Wikipedia, someone sneaked in a phrase that said, I'm a big P. <laughs> but I think they've removed it. What does that mean, a big P? I'm not going to use that word here. Oh, we can. Yeah, like, come on. <laughs> no, you, you know what I mean. Is it penis? No. It Pussy. Was. Pussy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, oh, that is exactly what they called me on Wikipedia. <laughs> How did they sneak that in, man? That's funny. <laughs> but but on a was serious some right-winger who decided to say that about me. Yeah. Mm. Okay, on a serious note, right? Uh, you were born in the Northwest. Mm. How does a young white boy from the Northwest end up in the ANC? Well, many, many years ago, when I was 16 years old, I was part of what we then called a missionary group that went to Soweto. And, you know, then it was apartheid. I lived in this very nice middle-class suburb. Yeah. And I was shocked by my first visit to Soweto. And you see, that in itself is already an indictment on apartheid and the way I grew up. Yeah, yeah. That only at 16 for the first time, I went to Soweto. Jeez. And I was shocked. I was really concerned about the huge differences that I saw between where I live and the privileged life that I had mm. and what I saw there. Mm. So I started asking questions. I started raising concerns. And then roughly a year after that, 1976, the Soweto unrests happened. I started asking in my school but don't you think that the youngsters in Soweto have a point? Mm. Don't you think they're right to rise up against this system of apartheid? And what did the teachers say? Oh, that caused chaos. Jeez. They wanted to expel me from the school. Just My poor parents that. had to come and plead to allow me to continue Whoa. to be in that school. I was in a very conservative, lower middle class, white school in Witpoorki in Krugersdorp called Hoerskool the Adelaar. Mm. And yeah, uh, it was not acceptable. Of course, there you just embrace apartheid. It was an all-white school. But um, I started asking questions. Those questions kept on turning over in my head. What are your parents saying at the time? Aren't they saying, Carl, chill, man, you're not even black? Of course they told me. Stop mm. your nonsense. My dad was a very conservative white Afrikaner. 
he was very upset by the questions that I asked. Because then I started making trouble in the church. Mm. Because, of course, I grew up in the white Dutch Reformed Church. Mm. Also a totally lily white church. Mm. And I started saying, but how is it possible? Every person is created in the image of God when I read the Bible. So surely any discrimination must be unbiblical and it must be a heresy. And that caused trouble. I was going through what in Afrikaans is called katechese, that is to allow you into the church to become an adult in the church. And the Duomni in the Witpoerki congregation wanted to refuse to allow me to come into the church because I was attacking this religion, this theology Mm. of apartheid. Mm. So under those circumstances, my parents were not very happy with me. I then went to the Rand Afrikaans University, which today is the Johannesburg University. I was a youngster. I was a bit naive. I thought I can do a few things and I will change the world. Mm. All of us, when we're young, believe we can do that. So I put up a couple of posters in some of the student areas saying Nelson Mandela must be released from prison, that there must be full integration at the university. I thought they didn't see me doing it. I went and did it in the middle of the night, but they caught me on the closed circuit television. Do you have any black friends at this time? No. Not at all? No. How would I have black friends? Yeah. I was growing up in a white Afrikaner family, a conservative racist family. What, What are your friends saying? Well, my friends didn't agree. Mm. Uh, I was then hauled in front of the Senate of the university. I was disciplined and I was expelled from the university. Jeez, God. So at the age of 18, 18 and a half, yeah. I was now expelled from the, the Rand Afrikaans University. My dad was furious. He was not a rich man. He suddenly had to pay back my student loans. Mm, mm. And he chased me out of the house. <laughs> So I ended up for two weeks walking the streets, sleeping in parks, trying to figure out what am I supposed to do now. Remember, I didn't have a support network. Yeah. And at this time... I didn't know people within the liberation struggle. I was just there on my own. You've gone against your parents. You've gone Mm. against your church. You've gone Mm. against your school. Rebel. You've gone against your friends. This is insane. No, it wasn't insane. It was sanity in a world of insanity. Mm. Mm. But then I went to see a priest, Father Simeon Kwane, who was at the St. Mary's Cathedral. I saw posters that he was having a fast protesting against the eviction of people from informal settlements. It was, I think, the Soweto newspaper. And I said, let me go and see him and ask him what he thinks I should do. Mm. So when I met with him, he said to me, well, you know, Carl, I'm not a white like you. I'm not yeah. an Afrikaner. I can't understand properly your dynamics. Yeah. But let me introduce you to Dr. Bayer Snudir. Dr. Bayer Snudir was an Afrikaner clergyman, but someone who came from the Bruderborn traditional Afrikaner background, okay. but he turned against apartheid. So when I met him, I must tell you, the first time I met him, I got a fright. I thought they brought the security police to <laughs> now arrest him. Because he was an Afrikaner worm. Yeah. He looked like an Afrikaner worm. He had a safari suit on. You know those safari yes, suits that yes, the yes. Bura wear? Yeah. Short, short with trousers shorts, yeah. with those socks that are pulled up with a comb on the side. <laughs> and the hush puppy shoes. Yes. The whole outfit. Yeah. It was as if he came right out of that cartoon character yeah. of what an Afrikaner is. Mm. But when he opened his mouth, it was wisdom. Wow. And he embraced me. He became my mentor. Mm. I always say he became the dad to me that my own dad could not be. Mm. So under those circumstances, I grew with him. He helped me to understand the challenges that we faced in South Africa. He helped me also to first get access to the liberation struggle organizations in South Africa and eventually also to the African National Congress. Mm, mm. So I joined the ANC because that is the question you asked yes, earlier. Yes, yes. How does this young Afrikaner boy end up in, in the, the African ANC. National Congress? I joined the ANC at the age of 19. I still remember June 1979 in Gaborone, just outside Gaborone on a little copy on a hill. 
and I committed myself to the liberation struggle. I then underwent very rudimentary training also for Mkontu Isiswe. Yeah. And I also became an underground operative for Mkontu Isiswe, specifically in a cell that we had in Alexandra. So mm. I know Alex Township and the people of Alex very, very well. well. I went later on to church there. I was part of a community factory that we set up there that did upholstery. I didn't have a job then, mm. so I always say one thing I can do well is to make chairs and couches because I know how to do upholstery work. I did that for two years, and every Sunday I would go to not the white Dutch Reformed Church, but now the product of apartheid, but the progressive product of apartheid, which was called the Dutch Reformed Church in Africa. Mm. And every Sunday I went there, it was a church in 12th Avenue in Alex. The Reverend Sam Booty was the pastor there together with Dr. Bayers Nodier. And every Sunday I got arrested. Every Sunday? Because, you know, those days you needed what they said a permit, mm. which was a kind of equivalent of a pass that you need as a white person to enter a black Jeez. residential area. That's crazy. Now, every Sunday, I would go to church. At the entrance to, to Alex, there the police are. Then they arrest me. They even became friendly with me. We were no longer having a fight. They will just say, hey, come. Then they take me to Bramley Police Station. After church, Dr. Nudia would come, bail me out of prison. Mm. Sometimes I managed to sneak in and get into the church. Mm. But then usually when I would come out of the church, they will wait for me and they arrest me again. So prison and church became church? the same thing for me. I kept on going from the one to the other. Why didn't you just stop going to church? How could I? Church was part of my community. Church was my entry into the community of Alexandra. That's where I made, you asked me about black friends. That's where I made my first black friends, mm. and that became my family. Mm. Remember, I lost my family. My mm. white Afrikaner family rejected me. Mm. This was my family now. Mm. So I was not prepared to distance myself. And uh, you, I'm sure you can see, if you look a little bit to how I am, I'm a bloody harder cop. Ne? <laughs> what, and the one thing, if you tell me, not to do something. Yeah. That's exactly what, what I'm going, going to, do? to do. So those guys who kept on telling me not to come to church, not to get involved in the apartheid struggle, they made sure that I was going to be part of the apart anti-apartheid struggle and that I was going to go to that church and be part of that community in Alex. And now the Afrikaners, do they still hate you? You know, there are some of them who hate me. Yeah. I see on social media the comments that they make. It is sad that 28, 29 years into our democracy, we still have this kind of racism that we have in South Africa. I don't think the white community has made the necessary adjustments. I think the white community in South Africa, and I don't want to generalize, because yeah. there are also people in the white community who have made a very good contribution to our liberation struggle and to change in South Africa. But the overwhelming members of the white community are not playing the game in South Africa. They continue to be racist. They continue to be arrogant. They don't want to accept that there must be restitution for what apartheid caused, the damage that apartheid caused. And they think they can just put the history, the past behind them as if it no longer has an influence on the present. We still have in this country the consequences of apartheid. Yeah. We still have the, what I call the birthmarks of the struggle against apartheid here. And whether you were born before 1994 or whether you are an after 1994 liberation child, when you're black, you still continue to suffer the consequences of apartheid. 100%. When you're white, and you were born before or after 1994, you still continue to be privileged because your parents were privileged, your parents were able to accumulate wealth and land and they were able to give you a good education. 
all of the things that are not easily part of the lives of black and especially African people. So to say that apartheid has come to an end is nonsense. Mm. Apartheid continues to be part of our lives. And the white people in this country who refuse to understand that, who lift their uh, heads up against black economic empowerment, who complain when a black young student is given an opportunity because they believe that there should be an equal opportunity arrangement for black and white students are wrong. Mm. Because we are not playing on a level playing field. And that playing field still needs to be leveled through black economic empowerment. And that's why I'm so disappointed with this government of us, ours now. Yeah. Recently, Inok Konongwane announced that they're going to get rid of black economic empowerment. They also want to get rid of black economic empowerment within the state-owned enterprises. Yeah, I think it's confirmed. I think it's going through. Yes, yes. Mm. Now, how on earth do you do that in a world where the majority of those industries that are still in control of these businesses are white? It Go and no look sense. at the tender, mm. uh, what we see. Yes, there's uh, progressive support for black businesses. Yeah. But who have the evergreen tenders? Who have the majority of the tenders at ESCO? Mm. Glencore and all those other companies. Mm. They are the ones who still continue to benefit from the economic system that we have in South Africa. And at a stage when this inequality is not getting better, but getting worse. Mm. When the gap between the rich and the poor is getting worse. And terrible, that man. gap between the rich and poor, we know, is also a gap which is actually dovetailing between black and white. Mm, mm. The black people, the African people in this country are getting poorer and poorer. Mm. Now that is happening under an African National Congress government. And here comes Cyril Ramaphosa and Inok Konungwane and they say we're going to get rid of black economic empowerment, which is supposed to bridge that gap. Now, yes, of course, black economic empowerment has not been hugely successful. It has given privilege and given opportunity to a very small sliver mm, mm, of very privileged black entrepreneurs. Mm. It has not really gone into depth in terms of the empowerment of the majority of South Africans. But here comes Cyril and he says, now we're getting rid of it. Mm. Now, what do you think is going to be the consequence of that? The entrenchment of inequality, the entrenchment of black disempowerment and white empowerment. Mm. And on top of that, you must have De Reuter, a white man who's now the CEO of ESCO, mm. standing up and saying, I don't care for black economic empowerment. Jeez. He comes arrogantly and say, you know that flippant phrase they use, I don't care whether the cat is black or white mm. as long as it catches mice. Wow. What have we done to deserve someone like Cyril Ramaphosa who allows people like the Reuter to come and insult the majority of people in this country and treat us as if he is still the white boss, because that is a boss scup mentality. Mm. And in the meantime, we are faced with a situation where everything gets privatized. Now, I want to tell you something. I grew up as a son of a railway worker. My dad was a fitter in Turner in the railways. So lower middle class, poor Africana. Yeah. But I've just told you I was privileged despite being not part of the upper class of, of the Africans. Mm, mm. Why was I privileged? I was privileged because my dad benefited from the South African railways. In those days it was called the South African Spoorweer. Mm. And that is a state-owned enterprise. The white Africana government, the National Party apartheid government, use state-owned enterprises very, very cleverly in order to uplift poor whites. Mm. There's a very good book by Dan O'Mara called Volkskapitalism, which explains exactly how these state-owned enterprises were utilized 
in order to advance and give a future to poor whites. Mm. My dad was one of the benefactors of that system. Okay. I am, as a child of my father, a benefactor of that system that was brought in by the Afrikaner National Party. Now, here we have state-owned enterprises. The same kind of model can be used to help to uplift black and African people. Hmm. Instead of trying to build these state-owned enterprises, give them more opportunity, bring in black managers, black excellence, like we had in Brian Mulefe and Marcelo Koko. Mm. What Cyril Ramaphosa does, he removes those people, he brings in whites, and he comes with a mandate, destroy, break up those state-owned enterprises. We now want to privatize them. Is it because the blacks are corrupt? No. You see, corruption doesn't have color. Individuals are corrupt. Not particular nations or peoples. There are corrupt whites, there are corrupt blacks everywhere in the world. Sure. But what we have to do is to make sure that the right people get appointed to positions of empowerment in state-owned enterprises. And we mustn't use this concept of corruption as a tool to destroy black people and African people. Mm. You see, I'm against corruption. Mm. And we should fight corruption. But what we've seen in South Africa is that suddenly the narrative is exactly what you said. Black people are corrupt. White people are not corrupt. Got people you. in government are corrupt. People in the private sector are not corrupt. Mm. Wow. You just cited yeah. Brian Mulefe as black excellence there at ESCOM. He's out on bail. What do you think of those charges of fraud and corruption? Well, let him face those charges, but let him not be found guilty in advance before those charges are actually brought in. What I know about Brian Mulefe is that Brian Mulefe managed to bring an end to load shedding that he was an excellent CEO of the PIC, that he was an outstanding CEO of ESCO, and that he made fundamental changes. And I believe that the sin of Brian Mulefe was that he was attacking these white monopoly companies with the evergreen contracts, that he was taking on Glencore. Yeah. If you go and listen to Brian Mulefe's evidence, when he was a witness in front of the State Capture Commission in front of Zondu. Mm. The very, very serious and detailed allegations that he made against Glencore and also against the role that President Cyril Ramaphosa played in that Glencore capture of ESCO and these evergreen pro uh, contracts that Glencore had and the billions that Glencore made out of those contracts. Now, the moment Brian started challenging those things, and started to bring a new configuration, he came under attack. Mm. It is the same thing that happened with President Jacob Zuma. It is the same thing that happened with Masalo Koko. So let them face the charges that have been brought against them, but understand those charges in a socio-political context and be very careful to say, hey, because Brian has been charged, he's corrupt. Because you see, our constitution has a maxim. And that maxim is, you are innocent until you found guilty. Mm. In this country, under Cyril Ramaphosa and the way that the State Capture Commission has now been operating, people are being put in a situation where they are guilty until they can prove their innocence. And that is fundamentally wrong. It is an injustice, and any approach in that way is a kangaroo court. And that's why I've got such a serious problem with the State Capture Commission, because the State Capture Commission present people as guilty when their innocence is there until they are proved guilty. A huge unfairness has been done to Brian Mulefe and Marcelo Coco in the way that 
the media is reporting as if they are criminals. And even a bigger in, injustice has been committed, and I've watched this happening over 22 years against President Jacob Zuma. President Zuma in our media has already been found guilty and sentenced for a matter around the issue of the arms deal that he could not even have been in any significant way involved in. Because at the time when the arms deal was concluded, President Zuma was not part of national government. He was in fact an MEC for economic development in KwaZulu-Natal. But he's the one who is being fingered as if he is now a criminal. And he cannot face those charges because of the manner in which the media has now turned him into an ogre. I've never in my life seen anywhere in the world, perhaps with the exception of what happened with Lula and Brazil, such vilification and such injustice against any political leader than what I've seen with President Zuma. You are quiet. No, no, <laughs> while you are speaking. No, hey, I, was, are, I finished. Uh, uh, okay. Are, are you saying you have a problem with the fact that a state capture inquiry exists or how it's been carried out? Are you saying there was no state capture? Or are you saying that other administrations were also captured because generally we know businesses, businessmen due to proximity to the current president or whatever will always benefit, you know, when someone is in power. So what are you saying exactly about the state capture? Did it not happen? You see, my problem is when you treat state capture as something which has happened over nine years during the Zuma administration. Because... I don't believe that the worst state capture happened in the last 10 or 15 years. When do you believe it happened? It happened many, many decades and centuries before through colonialism and those companies that grew out of colonialism. The real state capturers of the past and of the present are the Ruperts, are the Menels, are the Anglo-Americans, Anglo Vols, Harry Oppenheimer, and all of those very, very wealthy, small group of white people who controlled this economy and who controlled it in the past. Yes, we must be concerned about state capture, but you cannot have suddenly a report which is written by Tuli Madoncella in the most indecent rush especially given money by Praveen Gordon on a special release of funds from the Treasury in order to do a report that then find that President Zuma and the Guptas are responsible for state capture. And then you call it the capture of state report. And you demand that there must be a commission of inquiry into state capture, which must only cover this short period, this nine, ten year period, and only concentrate on certain things. Because you see, you let the main state capturers, the main culprits, off the hook. Yeah. And they are being let off the hook because this manner in which the state capture commission had come about is deliberately done in order to cover up the real state capture. If you cannot address the state capture that happened through the whole colonial and new colonial period. If you cannot deal with the role of Anglo-American, if you cannot address what the Ruperts did in this country and how your Anton Rupert, Johann Rupert's father, became such a wealthy person and how today Rupert basically has in businesses in every sector of our South African economy and our life. When you get up in the morning and you brush your teeth, you use toothpaste that Rupert is producing. Mm. When you comb your hair, the comb and that plastic that you have has been produced by Rupert. When you sit down to eat and you have some products from Unilever, it's from Rupert. You live under the shadow of Rupert and of Bidvest. Is that not state capture? Is it not state capture when a man who has been 
a, a very, very important businessman involved with Glencore, with Optimum Mine, becomes the president of South Africa. Mm. When that man has more than a billion rands given to him by these friends of his, the Glencores, the people from Investec, all of them, to make sure that he can buy his presidency. When he buys that presidency, and he even acknowledges that he used money to buy it. He says at the Zondu Commission, no, guys, but you're wrong. I didn't use a billion rand. I got it on the cheap, man. Uh. I did it for 350 million. Uh. He doesn't even deny it. Is that not state capture? Is it not state capture when someone had been groomed and nurtured to enter the African National Congress from his youth, who was part of the Urban Foundation? who when the wife of the second largest mining company, the owner of the second largest mining company in South Africa, Clive Menel, Irene Menel, the wife of Clive Menel, says openly, we brought Cyril in as an act of charity. Uh. At the same time, we brought him in as an insurance policy to secure our future. Uh. That is what they said when they brought Cyril Ramaphosa into the Urban Foundation. That is what happened when Harry Oppenheimer gave offices to the National Union of Mine Workers. What is not known generally is that there was close cooperation and collusion between Cyril Ramaphosa and Anglo-American in the establishment of the National Union of Mine Workers. The NUM was seen by the white monopoly capitalist owners of the mining industries in South Africa as an insurance policy, as a tool that they were creating in order to manage the increasingly unhappy and restless mining workers of South Africa. And Cyril Ramaphosa became that instrument of managing them. And then he moved through the ranks, came to the African National Congress very late. He's a Johnny come lately in the African National Congress. And suddenly he's parachuted into the ANC's conference, the first conference after the ANC was unbanned in 1991, in June 1991 in Durban, from nowhere. Who helps him to be parachuted in there? President Nelson Mandela. Mm. Why is President Mandela doing that? Because he's a close friend and associate of Clive and Irene Menel. Huh. And Clive and Irene Menel tells him, this guy, Cyril Ramaphosa, is just the right man for you. Bring him in. So there he is. He comes in from nowhere. He doesn't even know the culture of the African National Congress. I've worked with Cyril after he became Secretary General. He was a disaster. He was not rooted in the history and the culture of the ANC. He never understood the long liberation history of the ANC and where the ANC honestly came from since 1912. I watched him abusing his position as Secretary General to make business deals on the side in order to enrich himself. I watched he got him. his billions. Soro Ramaphosa became within a very, very short period of time, a billionaire. Over the same period that he made himself the chief negotiator of the African National Congress. Remember when the negotiations for Kudesa started, Cyril was not the chief negotiator, it was Thabo Mbeki. And the head of intelligence was Jacob Zuma. Both those gentlemen together with President Nelson Mandela were out of the country. Ramaphosa, in his capacity as Secretary General, called an emergency NEC meeting. At that NEC meeting, he called off a coup, pulled off a coup. He removed Thabo Mbeki as the chief negotiator and got himself placed in as the chief negotiator. He mo removed uh, Jacob Zuma, President Jacob Zuma, and he put Terra Lakota, Monsieur Lakota, in as the head of intelligence. And there you go. 
Now he was in control of these negotiations. And he was there in control of the negotiations together with the main negotiator of the National Party, Rolf Meyer. They became very close friends. In fact, they developed a friendship of a special kind. You can see the closeness when you see the pictures of that time. They made deals behind the scenes. How are we going to deal with the economy? How do we deal with the issue of land? How do we secure property rights? How do we establish these so-called sunset clauses that were allowing white administrators in the government departments to continue to keep their jobs? All of those things were deals made not in Kudesa, but on the margins outside Kudesa. Hmm. And then they were brought in, nicely coordinated, between Ruf and Cyril. It was the Ruf and Cyril show. And you know what is so interesting? Today, Cyril Ramaphosa has made, just in the last while, Ruf Mayer his special advisor in the presidency of South Africa. What does that tell you? A long process of collusion in order to achieve this disaster that we face today for the majority of black and African South Africans. And Cyril Ramaphosa was a plant right from the beginning to achieve that. I say that without any fear of contradiction. And that is why I've made the call. I made that call last year on the 3rd of November when it was the birthday of the Secretary General of the African National Congress, Comrade Ace Magashule. It was in Bloemfontein. The first time that someone stood up on a stage and said, Ramaphosa must go. Hmm. And when I said it, the comrades next to me, they were scared. They said, you're going too far. This is going to cost you. I said, guys, this is the only way. And you will see in the next year how this is going to play out. Because this man is a disaster, not just for the African National Congress, but for our country. And you've seen what came out. By the time I made that call that Ramaphosa must go, we already knew about the way in which he bought the vote and his presidency in 2017 at Nasrek. He closed think, uh, those uh, bank accounts. Do you but think, you, wait, wait, do you think Didi Mabuza was involved in that? All I know is that Didi Mabuza betrayed us. At the last moment, while he was saying he was there fighting against Ramaphosa and part of the radical economic transformation forces in the ANC, he suddenly flip-flopped. But the point I wanted to make to you is now we have Palapala. If you look at the detail of Palapala, it's a disgrace. The kind of crimes that were committed there are outrageous. It ranges from contravention of international foreign exchange laws to abduction, to torture, illegal possession of huge amounts of foreign currency and dollars, not declaring those to the South African Reserve Bank, not paying tax on it, contravening the executive code for ministers and for the president, evidently working on the side, having a side hustle, while the law doesn't allow him to do so. All of those things we are faced with, and that is why we are now at this knife's edge. Because you must understand that the next couple of days until the 19th of November are going to be absolutely critical for the history of South Africa. Because at the 19th of November, the independent panel, which is chaired by the former Chief Justice Ngobo, must now make a finding on whether Ramaphosa has a prima facie case mm. to answer. Mm. I can't see how it is at all possible for them not to find that he has a priva faki case. The evidence is overwhelming and detailed in the way that Arthur Fraser presented it. Now, once they make that finding, and I can tell you today, it will be extraordinary 
if they do not make a finding that he has a prima facie case to answer. And if he does, what happens after that? Then, and this is the issue, he has been creating this issue of stepping aside. Him and his friends in the NEC reformulated the resolution of the 54th National Conference about stepping aside, narrowing it only to being charged and saying, once a member of the ANC is charged, they must step aside. If you read the original resolution, it didn't say that. It said there are 10 different categories of challenges that an ANC member may be faced with. And then an ANC member, when faced with those challenges, must consider, for the sake of the integrity of the organization, to step aside in order to deal with the problem. Now, they narrow it only to the issue of, once you're charged, you must step aside. Mm. Now, what is Ramaphosa going to do if he's charged? And that was, forgive my pun, the multi-million dollar question that Tabu Mbeki asked two weeks ago when he said, what will happen if that independent parliamentary panel finds that Ramaphosa has a prima facie case to answer? And that's why I said we are now at a critical watershed moment what do you think in is the history happen? of it. I think he's going to have to face a prima facie case. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to try and resist still to resign, to step aside, and then the African National Congress will face its most significant litmus test. Because then the National Executive Committee of the ANC will have to meet, they will have to implement the step aside resolution, and they will have to force him to leave. If they fail to do so, they will act in a total, unacceptable, and without any integrity manner. And once that happens, the NEC or the ANC, which is already having lost most of its support and most of its relevance in our country, will totally lose any integrity and they will have to go. We will have to remove the National Executive Committee of the ANC if they fail to implement stepping aside against Cyril Ramaphosa. He must go. And the reality is that if there's any justice and if we want to save the African National Congress, he must go before the 55th National Conference of the ANC that is due to commence in December this year. What do you think is going to happen in that conference? Well, I'm not a soothsayer, but I hope that the branches of the African National Congress in a truly democratic way will speak and that they will speak out against this capture of the African National Congress and against this criminality of Cyril Ramaphosa and those around him. But if it's been happening for years, what do you think is going to change now? No, no, no. What we have seen since uh, the 54th National Conference was the abuse of money in order to buy positions in the African National Congress. The ANC has been turned into a stock fell. So it has now, become an auction for positions of leadership. It so has what are you become saying a now? crime. Are you saying scene. there won't be any money involved in the next uh, no, no, conference. I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm saying that there're going to be attempts obviously from Ramaphosa and others to use money. The challenge is for the rank and file members of the African National Congress, if they truly care for this country and if they want to save the ANC, the challenge is for them to resist the use of money, to make proper democratic decisions, to use the proper structures of the African National Congress and at that conference to get rid of Ramaphosa and his crooks and to put a new leadership in place there that will be representative of the will of the membership of the ANC and will implement the radical economic transformation official policy program, which has been the official economic policy program of the ANC since 2012. Who do you think but should it's win? it's not yet been implemented. Who do you think should win? As I say, I want someone to win 
who comes out of the proper democratic processes in the ANC. So you don't have I a can't, name I'm not going to give you a name because, you know, as you and I'm speaking here today, yeah. the branches are still busy nominating. Because yeah. remember, there's been an extension for branches. They can still nominate. The BGMs are still taking place. I have criticized those provincial executive committees that have tried to jump the gun and who started making pronouncements, we support this one and we support that one. I said, you're wrong, guys. Let the branches who are the most important building stones of the African National Congress make their decisions. Let's then tally up what are the nominations, who are the most prominent nominees, mm. and then we will know who will stand and who will be able to take over and become true leaders of the ANC, mm. not sell-out leaders, not plants, as Ramaphosa and the current leadership are. Do you think uh, you have a future in the new ANC, if you want to call it that? Do I think I have a future? Mm, mm, mm. If it's an African National Congress that democratically elects a leadership, yes. Mm. I have been nominated by over 400 branches of the ANC already. I am going to stand for the National Executive Committee of the ANC. And if there is true democracy, and if there's not a buying of votes and honesty prevail, a new leadership will be elected and I will be part of that leadership. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt about that. And I have committed myself that I will work tirelessly to change the African National Congress. When I was a young man of 19, I didn't join the ANC for this nonsense. Mm. I didn't join the ANC for it to become an elitist organization of comprador exploitative capitalists Eish. who are the policemen and women of white monopoly capitalism. Mm. I didn't join the ANC for that. I joined the ANC because I wanted to see full liberation. I sat behind a little radio, hidden away in my student house, listening on Radio Freedom, what President Oa Tambo was saying. And he said, liberation is not just getting rid of racism. It is also full economic liberation. Did you ever meet him, Oa Tambo? I met him when he came back from exile. He was already very ill. He had two major strokes. Mm. So I must say, sadly, I never met him at the height of, of, of his powers mm. because he was an incredible man. And Chris Honey? I met Chris and I, I had a closer relationship with Chris. In fact, I was in Brakpan at a meeting where Chris severely criticized the Kudesa negotiations just five days before he was assassinated. And I'm still maintaining that the assassination of Chris Hani needs to be properly investigated. What do you think happened? I According don't believe. I don't believe it was just one or two strange, radical right-wingers who killed him. What do you I think? I believe there was a conspiracy. I believe white monopoly capitalism was involved in it. I can't prove it because the investigations have been covered up, but I'm convinced that there are ANC people sure. who were involved in the assassination of Chris Hani. I'm hey, convinced God. of that. Sure. Hey. These must be higher up people then. I mean, if it's so... Yes, of course. Redacted and why, why were they so scared up? of Chris Hani? I've just told you. Chris was criticizing this cozy Kudesa uh, arrangement yes. that they were busy making. Mm. Go and look at the statements that Chris made in just those weeks before he was killed. He severely criticized what was happening at Kudesa. He was rejecting the sunset clauses. He started talking, and he did so with information. He started talking about leaders in the African National Congress who were selling out. Oh. He was saying, I fear that if we do not take control of our organization and stop it, we will have a small elite who will sell the birthright of our people sure. for the sake of driving Mercedes Benzes and BMWs and living in expensive houses. Which is what's happening now. Now, isn't that eerie? 
Mm. Those are exactly the things that's happening now. Was uh, President Nelson Mandela part of the people that Chris was talking about as sellouts? Well, you see, I'm always careful about judging President Mandela too harshly. Yeah. Because you must contextualize his life. Sure. He was 26 years in prison. Yeah. He came out of prison, an elderly gentleman, having to integrate a very complex world that he was suddenly released into. I blame those around him much more than I blame him mm. as an individual for the selling out process that played out. And let me give you one example. Mm. I wrote a speech together with the economic unit of the African National Congress for President Mandela in 1991, in December 1991, mm. where I said, that speech said, we commit ourselves still to the nationalization of the major sectors of our economy. We will continue to implement the Freedom Charter. All of those things were in this speech. Then President Mandela went to the first meeting that he attended of the World Economic Forum in Davao. Mm. Together with him, he took a young political advisor with the name of Tito Mbuweni. Mm. That speech that was written by a senior policy unit of the African National Congress, the Economic Policy Planning Unit, Tito Mbuweni in Davao took, removed all the clauses about nationalization, mm. changed the policy that Mandela was going to announce there to new liberal economic policies, Mandela read out the speech. I was shocked. We were listening to this speech. We said, what happened? What happened to the speech that we wrote? Mm. There was no discussion in the National Executive Committee of the ANC to decide that such fundamental, earth-moving statements could be made by Mandela at uh, Davao. Mm. But it happened. And Tito Mbuweni arrogantly a while ago at a conference in Rosebank was joking. He said, yeah, I took that speech that was written by the economic policy unit and I threw it in the trash can. Mm. We changed the ANC and the government and our economic policy with one stroke. And he was laughing. You see, it's no laughing matter. Well, you the know, people of South Africa, sorry to interrupt you. Know. you. The people of South Africa are facing the consequences of that dastardly act yeah. of betrayal that he committed there. Were you not uh, uh, mad at uh, President Nelson Mandela when he came out and you were overlooked um, for a minister position <laughs> and he chose another white person? Mm. Uh, I forgot the guy's name, man. Derek Hanako. Derek Hanako, <laughs> yes, yes. Were you not mad? I can tell you the background to that. Yeah. I was due to become a deputy minister. And the night before cabinet was announced, President Mandela phoned me and also a very old close friend of his, Comrade Ahmed Kathrada, yeah. who was already told that he was going to become Minister of Correctional Services. Got you. And President Mandela said, comrades, I am under pressure from some of my fellow comrades that I'm not addressing the national issue properly in my cabinet. Mm. That I'm having too many of the min so-called minorities mm. in mm. cabinet. I know that you are committed comrades. I know that you will understand it. I'm asking you, so to speak, to step aside from those positions. I'm going to also have to accommodate other parties in the government of national unity, including the Inkata Freedom Party, the old National Party, which was then called in a very illogical way the new National Party. It was an anomaly. But anyhow, I have to do all of that. So some of you comrades, can you accept that you're not going to get positions mm. now? Mm. But you will be accommodated. Mm. You don't say no to President Mandela. One understood this context. Mm. So no, I wasn't bitter or angry about that. Mm. I was, I must say, President Mandela always treated me in a very fair and proper way. Mm. Subsequently, a few years later, he made me the ambassador 
of South Africa to the Netherlands. And he did give Comrade Kefrada the position, a special advisor to him as the president in parliament. Mm, mm. So he was not unfair mm. in the manner he treated us. And I don't have a problem yeah. that Derek Hanekom at that stage was appointed as a minister. My problem with Derek Hanekom is not because he was made a minister at that point. My problem with Derek Hanekom is because of the manner in which he sold the struggle out subsequently. The way in which he didn't address the issues around land and the return of the land to the people without compensation when he was the Minister of Agriculture and of Land Affairs. Mm. The cozy relationships that he built up with the white landowners and white farmers at the cost of the majority of black people. Mm. The manner in which he subsequently went and made common cause with an opposition party to try and remove a sitting president in the person of President Jacob Zuma from government. The way in which he voted together with opposition parties. So anyone who wants to say that I have a bitterness against Derek Hanekom because he was made a minister in 1994. That is total nonsense. But if you ask me, do I have a deep, fundamental, seated anger and bitterness against Derek Hanekom for the way in which he sold out since? Yes, I have. I sat in prison with Derek Hanekom. He was a prisoner with me. He had a very short prison sentence of only two and a half years. Now, two and a, half, two and a half years is not short, but it's short compared to yeah. the long sentences that many of us got. This is in the 90s, yeah? That is in the 80s. 80s, okay. 80s and early 90s. Okay. Yeah? Remember, I was sentenced in 1983. Yeah. Now, I know that Derek and his wife got short sentences because they made a deal. Mm. Oh, snitches. They made it, uh, they didn't snitch, but they were making a deal. <laughs> well, that's snitching, you know. Yeah, they were making snitching. a deal. Because they had to give information no, for the no, deal, no, 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 they didn't. isn't it? They made a deal so that information that was critical about the way in which the apartheid government was cooperating with Renamu in Mozambique and was funding Renamu could not come out into the public domain because Derek and his wife were part of those who gave information to the ANC, which gave it to the government of Mozambique on Frelimo, how the apartheid government was funding, Frelimo, uh, uh, was funding Renamo. Mm. And that was courageous of Derek and his wife to do. Mm. But they did make a deal mm. in order to get a short sentence. Now, I could live with that, but I can't live with a Derek Hanekom who sells us out now. Mm. I can't live with a Derek Hanekom who makes common cause with Praveen Gordon and others. Hmm. And so I sat in a cell next to him. He was my comrade. We used to talk to each other. At night, I would pull myself up to the uh, window where the bars are, and we would talk through the window to each other. We had long political conversations. Did you guys get uh, special treatment because you were white in, in prison? No. We were kept apart. We were not on Robben Island because even in prison, white and black prisoners were kept apart. But beyond that, I can tell you, because we were a small group, we were probably more disadvantaged, at least in terms of the interaction that we could have had Got you. with fellow comrades. Got you. But let me make this point. I don't understand how someone that I could have had those conversations with and who I heard expressing himself so strongly for liberation and understood the history of this liberation struggle in the way that I understood Derek to understand it can sell us out mm. in the way he's doing now. I don't understand how someone like Derek Hanako can today say that he supports Cyril Ramaphosa, who is nothing else but a mafia boss. So my, my beef with Derek is not 
about whether he was a minister in 1994 or not. My beef with him is his betrayal of the liberation struggle right now. And he knows better. Before we move on from uh, President Mandela, uh, is it true that in um, 2017, no, when was it? In the 2000s, yeah? You were going through a, some financial crisis. Hmm? Uh, you asked him for money and he said no to you. No, I never asked. That is utter nonsense and lies. I never asked President Mandela for any money. Mm. I did go through financial difficulties. It is true that I did ask some fellow comrades to assist me, like comrades would do. Mm. And it is true that I had financial loans that I needed to deal with. Mm. It was not easy to do so, but I was not really in a very different position than many other South Africans yeah. Yeah. were under. And are still under. Yeah. You know, we are a society which is deeply and continues to live deeply in debt. Yes. But what happened was when I started raising concerns about what is happening in our country, mm. started raising my concerns, especially also about the economic policy program followed by Tabu and Becky, geared new liberal economic policies, so-called trickle-down theories that never work, Suddenly, this history, which was nothing really serious, mm. got elevated and used mm. in order to attack. Mm. And I acknowledged that I made mistakes. I dealt with those mistakes. Yeah. I addressed them. Yeah. They are behind me. Mm. But I am not going to continue to wear a jacket mm. that someone else tries to keep on putting on to me mm. because they don't like my commitment to the full liberation of the people of this country. Let me deal with another issue. Mm. You know, two weeks before 2017, yeah. the 54th National Conference of the ANC, suddenly I wake up in the Sunday morning on the front page of the Sunday Times, Niehaus claimed that his mother died and he is trying to get insurance policy mm. money. I never did. Huh. Up to this day, there's no name attached to the person they claim made that claim. Unsubstantiated. Why would they do that, though? Of course, to discredit me. Of course, to come and discredit also the whole campaign that I was part of in the run-up to that conference. I was faced with a very serious situation. Here are serious allegations. I went to my attorney, my then attorney, Ian Smallsmith. I said, Ian, you know, can you write to the NPA? Please write them a letter and ask them, is there any allegation that you are investigating against Carl Niehaus? Mm. The NPA wrote back, they said, we have no investigation against him. There are no charges that we even contemplate. I took that letter, I released it to the media. Silence. Wow. The only newspaper that wrote about it was a report. And you know what they said? Mm. I'll say it to you in Afrikaans and then I'll translate it into English. Yeah. Mm. Slippery Niaus escapes again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. <laughs> but it's also not funny. Sure. Yeah. Because yeah. why I'm saying to you, Saul, it's not funny. Here yeah, they make an allegation that I claimed that my mother died. Mm. Yeah. My mum is an elderly person. She's still alive? My mum is still alive. Wow. You're my so mum lucky, is huh? this year 93. Whoa. I'm very blessed. I, we had a beautiful birthday party for her on the 14th of April. Why did you go to the NPA? Why did you say, here's my mom? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well my mum is there. I, I said to my sister, I said to my sister, I want to sue these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She said to me, please, mum is not old. Yeah. Now you want to go into a legal process where these people who do not have any filter, who are evil, mm. will insist on her being called to give evidence. Mm. Do you want to do this to, to her at okay. this age? So I withheld. But one thing I can say to you categorically without any holding back, 
blatant, unmitigated, evil lies. And it angers me, but I'm not going to allow that anger to determine my life. I'm well, continuing with my life. I'm a very happy man. I recently paid La Bola. Oh, congratulations. For a beautiful yeah. car. Yeah. A I don't know if lady, your cameras yeah. can show her. Yeah, She's please here. show her there, man. Young, She's beautiful here lady. With yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yeah. Hey, Carl, so it's yeah. true. Once you go black, you can't go back, eh? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> you were black ages ago. <laughs> <laughs> not his first wife, this one, you know. How many wives? It's a fourth one now. This is my third marriage. Third, third marriage. marriage. No, but she's beautiful. You know? and, she's a, and she's a chiller. So I'm sure it's going to last. Yeah, she it will last. I can tell you, <laughs> all of us can make mistakes yeah. as long as you learn from your mistakes. Yeah. Before I've we, learned well from my mistakes. We and on. that is why I'm in the relationship yeah. with that woman because she's special. Yeah. She is a woman who can stand next to me mm. and we are a true partnership. She's a chiller, man. Shout out to you. Yeah, she's man. a chiller. Married a chiller. That's even how I knew well. about you guys. <laughs> sorry? Yeah, sorry? I knew about you guys yeah, through Nolly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, come, I, I get up, I, I, I'm busy working there in front of my computer. I, I look on television. Yeah. Podcast and chill. <laughs> I go back. Hour later, I'm coming, having coffee, <laughs> podcast. <and show. laughs> I said, now I must, I must find out what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Because my wife is now spending a lot of time with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, shout out, man. We appreciate the love. Uh, mm. Before we move on from the story about your mother and, um, mm. you know, what they wrote about you, with that in mind, who do you think runs the media in this country? White monopoly capitalism. Wow. You know who owns the media in this country? Yeah. Because they've said nothing about Cyril, but during Zuma's term, jeez, every well, weekend. Look, look yeah, they happened. would have milked the Cyril sagas. Pala pala look what happened with President Jacob Zuma. It was an avalanche of propaganda. Mm. Day after day. Why? Because he was Sunday with after him. Sunday. Every Sunday, the Sunday Times had a new front page story about President Zuma. Is it because he wasn't eating with them? He wasn't eating with them. He was talking white monopoly capitalism is wrong. He was saying we must have radical economic transformation. He was following policies that empowered black economic empowerment. Go and talk to young black entrepreneurs. They will tell you these so-called nine wasted years that this Ramaphosa accolades yes, referred to yes. were the years when they were empowered. Yeah, yeah. I was on a space together with Mary Pala, who is the president, Padi, sorry, not Pala, Padi, who is the president of the Black Truckers Association in mm. South Africa. And she told us, we got contracts. We were empowered yeah, yeah, yeah. through black economic empowerment. The moment, the phrase she used, she said, and then Nazareth happened. She said, and the moment that happened, suddenly, all these empowerment projects were removed. Suddenly, we were subjected to the most stringent of tests before a black business person and a black trucker could actually get involved in ESCOM and other government you know, you SOEs. Know, you know, it used to trickle down to clubs even because yes. uh, the tenderpreneurs would come and blow some of their money at the clubs mm -hmm. and then DJs would get booked and mm -hmm. Slay Queens would make money. <laughs> <laughs> now yeah. I was waiting for you where you're going now. <laughs> now, because I know a couple of entrepreneurs, they complaining. Yeah. I'm sure you do so. Yeah, taps they said, are dry. Uh, yeah, Cyril's closed the taps. Taps He's are dealing dry. with the white people. Entrepreneurship is not something to encourage, mm. but black economic empowerment is something that should be encouraged. Mm. And of course, tenders is part of black economic empowerment as long it is not patronage mm. and as long as it's not illegal tenders mm, mm, being mm. given to your friends and your chumps. Mm, mm. But tender, black economic empowerment, should be part of our economic empowerment program in South Africa. BBBE is critical for the future in this country and it is far too early, ridiculously early, to start talking now about lifting black economic empowerment as Ramaphosa and his accolades. Yeah, it's closing the tabs. No. 
they are closing the transformation process. Closing the taps has got a negative connotation. Because it's a negative thing to do. When it is corrupt. But allowing black economic empowerment, allowing black entrepreneurs to be able to have a good stake in the economy and to grow their involvement in the economy, allowing BBBE to happen and also to have equity employment is critical Mm. and should not be described as if it is corruption Mm. because that is the language of white monopoly capitalists Mm. and racists. Mm. And we mustn't allow ourselves to be misled Mm. by taking that language of those white monopoly capitalists and racists and then allowing it to be turned against us oh, as a black and African people in this country. I get you. And then allow black and African people in this country to be described as corrupt. Mm. Because you see, that is the insidious process that happens where black people are even being made to believe themselves mm. by this propaganda nonsense that they are corrupt. Yeah, but it doesn't help when, you know, like the COVID money, PPE money gets squandered. No, it's an outrage what happened. Yeah, the but PPE that doesn't money. help as well. And then no, of course you not. read stories about Eddie Soti and all these guys. That but doesn't you see, help. the worst corruption that we've seen since 1994 happened under Ramaphosa. The COVID-19 support funds, billions of rands, were siphoned off under the Ramaphosa administration. The banks, white controlled banks, were given funds to administer in order to assist those small and medium-sized businesses who were suffering because of the COVID-19 regulations. Who did they give that money to? White Hmm. businesses. So The minister minister who is responsible for those particular administration of those funds, even had to acknowledge herself and said, 70 and more percent of the money that was due to go to the empowerment and support of small and medium-sized businesses went to white businesses. So during COVID, when he went on TV and said the Ruperts have donated a billion, (laughs) this other family donated, that was just all BS. Well, the implementation of it was BS. Yes, Jeez. and there were always strings attached. This was never money just out of the largesses and the kindness of Mr. Rupert and of the Oppenheimers handed out. Go and read what was subsequently said about those funds, how those funds were managed, controlled, and manipulated. Mm. It was used in order to create an economic structure, an economic foundation, that will continue to benefit white monopoly capitalism and the current status quo in this country. Mm. Black economic empowerment took a severe knock during the COVID-19 regulations. The COVID-19 regulations was part of an instrument and tool in order to cement in the control of white monopoly capitalism over this economy. We are much worse off after COVID than we were before. Mm. And black economic empowerment has been put severely back because also of the COVID-19 regulations. Can you tell me about your relationship with uh, former President um, Jacob Zuma? Mm -hmm. How did you meet him? Did you meet him at uh, Mkonto Asizwe? How did you guys meet? Look, I worked with President Zuma in the underground for many years. He was one of the most effective commanders of Mkontu. He was an amazing underground operative. What many people don't know is that he spent sometimes months, six months or more, inside the country, in the underground. Jeez. Especially in northern KwaZulu-Natal. So he was a very, very effective operator. And of course he was also a very important intelligence officer of the African National Congress and later on became the head of intelligence of Mm. the ANC. But for me, the most significant, most important meeting I had was in prison with President Zuma. Mm. Because I was imprisoned 
I served a prison sentence of almost 10 years. The apartheid regime were viciously opposed to me being released, even when the ANC was unbanned and the negotiations started for what eventually became Kudesa. Kobi Kutsi, who was then the Minister of Justice, said, we're not going to release this traitor, this white burki. They released other political prisoners, but I kept on sitting in prison together with a few other ANC prisoners. For real? Yeah, I was one of the last political prisoners to be released. Jeez. And then one morning, while I'm sitting there in my cell, I get called. Come through. Can I continue? Yeah, yeah. Or what are happened? we having an attack? <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, something in, just dropped. In yeah. South Africa, nowadays, you start worrying when you say certain things, whether someone is not going to come and try and take you out. Yeah, and you've got a laser I'm, there in your eye. And there. say... <laughs> <laughs> which, which eye is it? Hey, man, the right one or the left? Heart attack. <laughs> No, it's just our lights here. It's just, our uh, lights. It's just here. Okay. It's fine. I'll keep on. I'll talk fast to try and get out what I want to get out before they shoot. Yeah. But, <laughs> no, no. But okay, that's flippant, but more serious. Yes. There are, as we can see, people yeah. who die in this country yeah. because they speak out. As you're speaking here, I'm like, are you remember, not afraid of your remember life? Remember that uh, lady who spoke out as a whistleblower mm. with what happened at the hospitals. Mm, mm, she died. Mm, mm, yeah, no, no. Yeah. She was shot dead. Mm. The Tembisa Hospital mm. tender mm. disaster. Mm. And there's more and more indications that so these you're not, you're not people who were involved in those tenders are people who are very closely associated with President Ramaphosa. They're even family members of President Are you not afraid? Because you hate him. This is... I don't hate him as a person. I hate his policies and I hate what he does to the ANC. And that's why I want him to go. But let me tell you the story. How has he not gotten rid of you in the ANC? Well, he has tried very hard. Oh, he's tried, okay. Uh, disciplinary actions. Remember, gotcha. I was fired from my job as a, a senior manager in the office of the Secretary General. I'm still facing disciplinary charges, ridiculous charges that they keep on trying to introduce and they keep on failing to do so. So what's your title now? I'm a member of the African National Congress. I'm a veteran member of the ANC gotcha. with 43 years wow. of membership. Shout out, man. Shout out. Shout 43 out. and I'm proud. Of Carl, it. quick question. I mean, you, 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 like, you roll for Zuma hard, you know. It sounds like you guys are very close. When you were going through your financial problems, could you turn to him for assistance? No, I didn't. Uh, because President Zuma, like myself, came from the struggle. We were people who didn't have two dimes to rub together. We came out of poverty because we were committed to the liberation struggle. So no, I did not turn to President Zuma. But where I did get assistance from President Zuma, and that is where I was beginning to tell you yes, about yes. that visit, yes. and then we started yeah, talking course. about other yeah, things, yeah. because that's how conversations yes. go. Yeah. 100%. Um, then I was called while I'm sitting there in my cell, and they say, you have a visitor. Mm. When I walk into the visiting room, there is Mshalozi. Mshalozi. He came back as the leader of the negotiating team of the African National Congress and he was faced with this situation that this man is not being released. Mm. And he said, I want to see him. Mm. So he came to see me in prison and he made a promise to me there. He said, I will get you out of prison mm. and I will not rest until you are released. And every time... He came to visit me, and he came to visit me several times. Mm. He will say to me, I'm going to get you out. And when he leaves there, he would phone my mum and dad. Now, remember, I told you who my mum and dad are. Yeah. Right-wing Afrikaner people. Yeah. My dad was very right-wing. And um, they didn't really like these phone calls from Jacob Zuma. Yeah. But he continued. He oh. insisted on informing them and trying to keep the family ties And you haven't together. had any communication with them? 
until that time when Jacob Zuma decides to call them? Well, you know, my mum came to visit me in prison a oh, few okay. times, okay. but it was once a year, perhaps yeah. twice a year, very little contact. Gotcha. Yeah? But President Zuma insisted that I must be released together with all other political prisoners. And he made it a precondition before the main negotiations for Kudesa started. And he succeeded. Now, you know, people ask me why, and this is the question you are so, mm. you're so close to President. to President Zuma. I'm close to him because this man showed me loyalty mm. in the most difficult time of my life. You can imagine what it feels like you see other people being released. Eish. The ANC is unbanned. Mm. But you're still sitting in prison. Yeah. And the prison warders used to mock me. They would say, ah, you see, everyone is going to go out. They're going to forget about you. Mm. You're going to sit here forever. Mm. Yeah? Mm. But he gave me hope. What did Mandela do in that time? Well, Mandela was uh, obviously just released from prison. He was part of that negotiating process, but okay. of course it wasn't his duty and function to deal directly with some of these issues. He uh, was dealing on a different level. Yes. So I can't blame him mm. for not having taken this issue on his shoulders. Mm. He did visit me once in prison. Mm. So I must acknowledge that he did that. Mm. And I must always be fair to President Mandela, he always treated me fairly. Yeah. That I must give him. Mm. But the person who showed me true comradeship and warmth and who went out of the way, who walked the second mile with me was uh, President Jacob Zuma. And that is something I'm not going to forget. Right. You know, for me, loyalty Means is the everything. most important thing in the world. I will continue to show President Zuma loyalty I will continue to support him. I am convinced that he's been treated unfairly. As I've said to you earlier, I'm convinced that he's targeted because of his opposition to white monopoly capitalism and his attempts to implement radical economic transformation. What and do you think that is why he is the victim and that is why he's being attacked. That's why he's still going in and out of court up to this day. What do you think about his relationship with the Guptas? Well, you know, I'm always asked about the Guptas, and I don't know the Guptas. I've never met them. I don't have any relationship with them. But I look at them and I see business people who were, in the bigger scheme of things, actually quite small business people. Okay. They were not the Ruperts of this country. I get you. Or the Oppenheimers. Mm. What I do see the Guptas have done was that they disrupted some of the operations of these big companies. Ah. And I think part of the reason why they became under attack was because they were disruptive. They had to go. I can't judge on everything that they've done, on whether they behaved proper in every regard. I'm not going to try and go that route. Yeah. I believe very simply in the rule of law. Mm. If they had done anything wrong, then let them be charged. Mm. Let them be brought. All right, guys, what's going on? Okay. More bottles falling hey. around. <laughs> hey. Can you remain still, doggy? Eh? <laughs> let them be charged and let them then get the right to be able to defend themselves in a court of law. They haven't been given that opportunity. They have been found guilty and have been sentenced in a public kangaroo court by media who make all kinds of allegations while there's been no trial where those allegations had been proved. And I'm still wondering what is the story that we heard about them having been arrested in Dubai. Mm. Who knows what's going on there? Mm. We hear stories, rumors. Yeah. Oh, the Guptas have been arrested. Where's the, where are they? Mm. Have we been, would we have been shown photos of their arrest? Mm. Mm. Have we have been given documentation about their arrest if it really happened? Mm. Or are we be just being told a load of fibs mm. by the Minister of Justice, Ronald Lamola, and some other propagandists? Mm. Because why is it so difficult to show us that this so-called arrest has taken place. But anyhow, I, I'm not here to be... 
When does he speak a, to... A, a, a person who wants to be an apologist for yeah. the Guptas, I'm not. As I told you, I've never met them in my life. When last did you speak to President Zuma? Two days ago. Oh, for real? Hmm? What are you guys talking about? Well, how he is, how his health is. I complimented him on an excellent speech that he made in Etiquini. Mm. Uh, I thought he was courageous in the way that he pointed out the wrongs that Cyril Ramaphosa has done and continues to do. I thought he was very good in terms of how he explained to people what needs to be done in order to save the African National Congress, to, to help the ANC to become again a full liberation movement. Mm. I thought it was an excellent speech, and I told him that. Mm. I, I, you know, I do a Twitter space. Yeah, what is it? I'm calling it In My Crosshairs. Yeah. You know, like the crosshairs of a gun that mm, mm. I, I target something and then I go for Oh, it. fantastic. And uh, one of the discussions we had is that I invited him to come to one of those In My Crosshair sessions. <laughs> he said he will come. Yeah. Let's see if he comes. Yeah, we're but, trying to... Uh, I, I would love to have him in one of those sessions where the thousands of people who join my In My Crosshairs can, can engage with him. Because the Twitter space is very personal. Yeah. You know, you can talk nicely directly with people. And I hope that opportunity will arise. So, yeah, those are the things that we discussed. We're trying to get him on the podcast. We extended an invite. Been, yeah. Yeah, and um, waiting for him to respond, but hopefully he'll come as well. well but we want to talk about his... Remember his... He, had, uh, he had 15 months where he was unable to do any of these interviews mm. and speak because he was, he was muzzled. Yeah. Because of that ridiculous sentence of the Constitutional Court, which I believe fundamentally was illegal in terms of our own national law, but also in terms of international law. Mm. A huge injustice yeah. was committed to President Zuma, and I hope that that injustice can still be corrected. Mm. And part of that injustice is the way in which he was treated. Mm. Even when he applied for medical parole, the way in which his medical records were leaked, the way Billy Downer and Karen Morn collaborated with each other in order to get those documents illegally out. And I'm very happy that Downer and Morn are now in the dock and that there's a private prosecution by President Zuma against them for their criminal acts. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm having a little tiff. Mm. What else can I call it with Karen Morn? Mm, mm. Because I used an English and Ndebele saying, mm. Kick the dog until the master comes out. Mm. And I want to link it to the question you asked me earlier. You said, who's in control of the media? Of course. The white monopoly capital. Mm. Karen Morn works for News 24. We know who's the boss of News 24. Kurs Becker. Mm. We know who's her immediate boss. A propagandist of note, Adrian Basson. Karen Morn is now attacking President Zuma. She went through that illegal act of taking his medical records, publishing them. She's day after day viciously attacking advocate Tbusi Nkubane, the public protector. And then I say, hey, this is unacceptable. And I respond to those vicious tweets of hers. And I said, you know, perhaps the time has come that we must kick the dog until the master comes out. And mm. the master are the business people behind News 24. Mm. The master is Basson and Becker and all of those. <sighs> Suddenly I'm responsible for gender-based violence. <laughs> wow. All of a sudden. Now I must get legal lawyers' letters saying, oh, you are literally saying that Karen must be kicked. Mm. Oh, poppycock, man. <laughs> I, I've never said that she must be kicked. I used it in a figurative sense. Mm. That phrase exists in English since... When was it? In the 14th century, mm. when I did my research, it first became known in English. And it is also in, in, in the Bele, I'm sure mm. you know. Yeah. Kick the dog until the owner or the master comes out. Mm. Come I will Lenja. never, never in my life... <laughs> huh? Kavalenja. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> there you go. I will never in my life 
suggest that anyone should be kicked. Mm. Never. I'll never literally make that suggestion. Mm. I'm against gender-based violence fundamentally. Mm. But really, Karen mustn't do herself and other women a disservice to abuse gender-based violence to try and come and attack me for a political argument that we have. And what's the relationship like with uh, Ace Mashakhule? Whatever his name is. <laughs> Comrade Ace is a good friend of mine. Mm. Uh, I've worked with him over many, many years. I like the man. I like especially his ability to work with people on the ground. He is a true people's person. I believe that he's feared by Ramaphosa and those around him because of Comrade Ace's ability to mobilize people on the ground, because of his grassroots support. And of course they wanted to remove him from the engine room of the African National Congress, mm. the SGO. Mm. They wanted to remove him because they wanted to manipulate the processes that is running up to the coming conference. Mm. Because they knew under his management and control that would not have been possible. So a huge disservice was done to Comrade Ace Magashule. The way in which he was forced to be suspended, the way in which they abused this so-called stepping aside resolution, on silly charges of uh, um, oversight, mm. which no one can explain to you what exactly those charges are, mm. where there's no proper charge sheet. It is an outrage. And the way in which the NPA and our court system has allowed themselves to be used and abused in order to remove Comrade Ace from that position as Secretary General of the ANC and to suspend him is absolutely unacceptable. And in the same way that I have supported President Zuma over all the 22 years of his persecution, I will support Comrade Ace because injustice is injustice. And injustice must be fought and those who are the victims of injustice must be supported. I know what it's like to be mistreated. I know what it's like to face injustice. I faced it under apartheid. I faced it among some of my comrades who abused some of my very basic financial problems that yeah. I have to mm. try and destroy me. Mm. I know what it's like today to face trumped up charges in the National Disciplinary Committee of the African National Congress, I've earned that T-shirt. Mm. I'm not going to stand idly by and watch other comrades like Comrade Ace and President Jacob Zuma to be abused. I will stand up and fight for them. What do you think about the... What's the Comrade Ace's scandal, Gonje? <laughs> hey, man. It's got uh, quite a few. Hey, where's fact checker yeah, when you is need it her? The asbestos you sound thing. like the white monopoly capitalist media now, so he's got <laughs> oh, quite a few on. scandals, <laughs> my brother. Wow. Well, uh, well, not him directly, maybe, but you know. Uh, no, no, but you see, you stuff can't that take, happened in the. You can't when take he was Peter Louis Mayberg's book. He wrote a book. This chap called Peter Louis Mayberg. It's called Mafia State or something like yes, that. Yes, with him on the cover. With Ace Magashule on the on cover. On the cover, I remember that book. And now he makes wild allegations in that book and he claims that the asbestos thing... Asbestos, Yeah, that's yes. what you wanted mm, to know. But mm. you see, the asbestos issue had nothing to do with Ace Magashule. Okay. Comrade Ace was the premier of the Free State. Yeah. Mm. There are accounting officers who dealt with the asbestos contracts. The premier is not an accounting officer. Oversight is something which suddenly had been grabbed from the blue sky and now it's imposed on Comrade Ace. Mm. But let me tell you, so because, you know, I'm not blaming you to mm. say there's many scandals sure. because that is what white monopoly capitalist media does. It throws these things into the public domain and all of us become the consumers yes. of this nonsense. Yeah. Peter Louis Mayberg is told to write a book by Professor Anton Haber, who is also the chairperson of the Taku Kaper Foundation, which is a foundation which supports journalism. Hmm. They then give Peter Louis Mayberg a very substantial grant to write the book. Wow. Hundreds of thousands of rands. Hmm. Hmm? He writes the book, 
you can go and read that book. If you try to find cross-references, you try to find facts, it's not there. Wow. It's all hot air. But he writes the book. Once he publishes the book, the very same Taku Kaper Foundation, the very same Professor Anton Haber, now gives that book an award. <laughs> they say, hey, you know, this is the best investigative book for the year. Wow. And the Taku Kaper Foundation is giving an award to Peter Louis Mayberg of another very substantial amount of money. So he's paid to write the book. When he concludes successfully his lynch job, he's then given an award mm. for having written the book. That's crazy. Now, I don't want to be crude, mm. but I said somewhere in one of my tweets, as far as I can see, that's masturbation on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> masturbation on steroids. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, what else is self-gratification? Yeah, yeah. Helping someone to write a book and then giving him an award to have written the book. And so it goes on and on and on. And that is what our media have become. Hmm. And that's why in my reply to Karen Morn a day ago, I quoted the Pope. And I said, Pope Francis said, there are journalists, I'm not going to use the big Latin words, but he said, there are journalists who like shit mm. and who shares the shit with the public, and that is a sin. So and surely, this is the kind of nonsense that we are faced so with. So surely platforms like these, um, they don't like them, and we're going to come under fire soon because people come on here and tell it like it is, and they don't want people to know the truth. Of course. Nah. And programs like what you are doing will come under fire. Nah. I, they already my, tried. Remember they did a whole smear campaign in the media. Oh, oh yeah, they've yeah. been at it. But, yeah. but you see, you're not part of the mainstream media. Yes, yes, yes. And because you're not part of the mainstream media, you're under attack. Mm. And you are having difficulty to be able to get your programs out. Yeah. You have to do it. Advertising. Of, you, do, you don't get the advertisements. No, no, no. Because you're not talking Same the language. narrative that they want you to speak. Mm. My Twitter space, every time that we have the Twitter space, it's under technical attack. <laughs> then I fall off. Then this one goes. Then my guest in mid-sentence gets cut. Yeah. Ne? But we will continue. Mm. Because we have a right to freedom of speech. 100%. We have a right to speak our minds. Mm. You know, I fought with comrades who died for freedom of speech. Mm. Mm. You know, people... Perhaps we don't know how terrible it was mm. under apartheid. Mm. That you literally could have been killed for having scratched. As one uh, mine worker happened, he went to jail and then was subsequently killed for having scratched on his mug ANC. Sure. Yeah? So are we going to let all these rights and very important privileges that we have which are enshrined in our constitution being taken away from us because we are now not talking the narrative that these people who want to sell us out to big imperialist powers and companies don't want us to speak or are we going to speak out they don't even live in this country which is weird yeah but you know find out who funds the Daily Maverick? The Daily Maverick, who on a daily basis tells us that Cyril Ramaphosa is the best thing since cheesecake. Who funds him? It's not local South African funders. It comes from the United States of America, mm. from the Open Society Foundation, from George Soros. So imperialist funders are funding an organization, a news media organization here in South Africa, and we think they're going to tell us the truth. Why is, why is it that Arthur Fraser is so viciously attacked by the Daily Maverick? Why? I tell you why. Because it doesn't fit 
the narrative that the imperialists want because Cyril Ramaphosa is their blue-eyed boy. Well, he can't be blue-eyed, he's a black guy. <laughs> but he's their blue-eyed boy, sure. so to speak. Again, I'm talking now... Talk, talking black guy. I'm talking in a metaphor, if Karen Morn can understand it. But she's, a little <laughs> bit, she's a little bit linguistically challenged, so perhaps she may not be able to understand <laughs> oh, my oh. metaphors. But that is why Cyril Ramaphosa is under attack. Mm. And don't forget... Other phrase you mean? Um, I, well, yes, I mean mm. half a phrase. Mm. And don't forget that Cyril Ramaphosa, when he went to the States, the first visit after he became president, who was the first civilian after he met the president that he met? Mm. George Soros. Mm. The pictures are there. Is it true this that is the uh, same man who funds the Daily Maverick. Is it true that South Africa is... Because uh, we asked Rob Hersov when he was here <laughs> that South Africa is registered as a company in America. Apparently so. I Man. haven't investigated that in detail, but I understand that apparently South Africa is registered as a company in America. What does that mean for us? It's ridiculous. I find it outrageous. How can it be? How can South Africa be a company registered in the United States of America? That thing, we must get to the bottom of it, and that nonsense must come to an end. If it is true, I'm not sure. Mm. Because, and I'm not trying to say it's not true, sure, I sure. just don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it is true, it, it must be stopped. It is an outrage. If it is true, what does it mean? It means we are, you know, we are actually the, in the ownership of uh, some other country. <laughs> How is that possible? Yeah. <laughs> it can't be. Jeez, I mean, you we are, You seem to be dumbfounded now. Yeah, no, I mean, we are, but for them to do it like that, like, that's just But, like, I mean, mm. it can't be as blatant as that. It is. If you check, the, the offices are even in Pretoria somewhere. Ah, then, then we must bring an end. <laughs> it's wild. And how do we allow nonsense like that to exist? It is an outrage to our own sovereignty. Yeah. And independent. I don't know if you watched the Rob Hersov interview, did, but what do you think about his vision for the new South Africa. No, I haven't watched the Rob Hershoff uh, yeah. interview, so I can't really comment mm. on what he said to you. I have issues with Rob Hershoff. Yeah. My issues are that he seems to come over as a very self-entitled, arrogant white man. Mm. And I don't like that. Mm. Yes, his criticisms about Cyril Ramaphosa recently, he seems to have gone through some conversion. Mm. And he changed his mind because that's not always what I heard him say. Mm. But the manner in which he speaks about black people mm. and about black South Africans and black South African management mm. is unacceptable to me. Mm. So I find it difficult to be positive about Hershoff, and I can't just be positive towards him because he criticizes Cyril Ramaphosa. Is he part of the... The manner in which he does it makes me feel that this guy hasn't really gone through a fundamental conversion. He just doesn't like what Ramaphosa at this point is doing because he can see that Ramaphosa is messing up so horribly that even his own white monopoly capitalist interests are now being uh, put in danger because of Ramaphosa's incompetence and criminality. Is he not part of the Oppenheimer's Ruperts? Of course he is. Jeez. And you should have asked yeah, Mr. Hershoff, if he's not, what did he say? What did he say? I forgot, man, but we asked him, didn't he? Uh, yeah, denied. Oh, he denied. Obviously. Yeah, How denied. can he deny it? His, his family denied. has been part of that. He's been a very wealthy white South African for a very long time. Mm. And uh, so, so, you see, that is part of what worries me when someone like Hershoff then denies mm, mm. something which is so blatantly mm. a reality. Mm. You see, if you're a white South African, and I include myself, I'm white, I can't sure. take my skin off and get rid of it. If you're a white South African, you must acknowledge what went wrong under apartheid. Mm -hmm. You must acknowledge the consequences mm -hmm. of what happened. And you must be prepared that the restitution must be paid. Mm. And if you're not prepared to do that, if you don't want to see that happen, then you haven't been a person who's really been converted to the new South Africa. Mm. And you haven't shed your racism. So that is the challenge. And 
If I ever, I've never met Rob Hirschhoff, yeah. but if I ever meet him, I'll ask him. You know, do you acknowledge that you were part or are still part of white monopoly capitalism? What are you doing about it? Are you prepared to see restitution in this country for the wrongs of the past? And those answers will give me an idea of where the man is. But the arrogance with which he speaks, the white entitlement arrogance that I still detect in him doesn't make me feel positive about it. So we've been speaking about all that's wrong in the country right now. What's your vision? What's the solution? What do you see the future of SA? First of all, in the immediate short-term future, we must get rid of Sir Ramaphosa now because he is the personification of this capture that has taken place of the African National Congress through infiltration by white monopoly capitalism and imperialist powers. Secondly, we need to put a leadership in the African National Congress there that are reflecting of the democratic processes that should take place in the ANC and that leadership must be truly coming from the grassroots members of the African National Congress. We must get rid of this idea that there's a small sliver of elite in the ANC mm. who are entitled to leadership. Mm. All of us who are members of the ANC, if we are capable and if the ANC membership supports us, are entitled to be leaders in the ANC, as long as we get the democratic support. Mm. Mm. Thirdly, we must have a proper discussion about economic policy and understand the history of the ANC. And that economic policy program must break away from new liberal economic policies, must break away from the so-called idea that the rich will allow something to trickle down to the poor and somehow the poor will then be uplifted. We must fundamentally radically transform the economic structures in this country. That must include the return of the land to the people, and it must be the return of the land without compensation. Restitution without compensation. We must include in that process the transformation of our financial institutions that they will empower small and medium-sized businesses that wants to rise up and wants to eventually get to the commanding heights of our economy. I can't give you a detailed economic mm. program here in this mm, interview, mm, mm. but it has to be fundamental. It has to include the 10 clauses of the Freedom Charter. So the land must be returned to the people. The wealth must be shared amongst the people, both the wealth on top and underneath the soil. And there must be free and equal education we must ensure that housing will be there for all South Africans. We must ensure that the majority of black and African people can take control of this economy. That will not happen through new liberal economic policy programs. It will not happen through trickle-down theories. It will happen through a fundamental transformation, a radical transformation of this economy through the nationalization of the South African Reserve Bank, through the establishment of a state bank, through the establishment of economic programs that will empower the majority of poor and oppressed people. If we do not do that, if we do not make that fundamental break and bring that transformation, South Africa is doomed. If we continue along the road of Enoch Kodongwane and what happened with the medium term uh, budget program that was tabled just a week ago, which is just ever so much continuation of new liberal economic policies, plunging us into deeper and deeper debt with the World Bank and the IMF. We are doomed and our children do not have a future. How come you never implemented any of these things? Because, I mean, you've been in the ANC for 43 years. It's a good question. And of course, I must take co-responsibility for that failure. But part of the answer is the way in which white monopoly capitalism continued to infiltrate the ANC and control the policy-making processes in the ANC. 
I've just given you earlier in this interview examples of how Tito Mbuweni and others derailed yeah. mm, mm. the radical economic transformation program that the ANC had when it returned from exile to South Africa. How Nelson Mandela made announcements that scuppered that program. Mm. It was very unfortunate. It was a tragedy. And unfortunately, throughout President Mbeki's term, that program of new liberal economic policy was cemented in. He had a two-thirds majority in parliament. He mm. should have been able mm. to do for us what we needed. He should have been able to have the expropriation of land without compensation. It was possible. Mm. We could have changed Section 25 of our Constitution to make that possible because he had the two-thirds majority. He did nothing. He did the law law with that two-thirds majority. He wasted it. It's a shame. So all of us must take responsibility. But at the same time, we must also not come and try and carry the can for the real sellouts like Cyril Ramaphosa, Praveen Gordon, Derek Hanakom, Enoch Gordon-Wane, and all of the rest who today have turned themselves into the policemen and women of white monopoly capitalism. What do you think about other parties like FFDA? Well, the DA is a racist party. I will never support the DA. I despise the leadership of the DA. I despise the economic policy program. I despise the way in which they treat the few black and African people who are in that party. You can see what they do mm. to black leaders in the DA. Mm. They destroy them mm. because they consider them to be experiments to be used in order to advance mm. white interests. Mm. So the DA is a no-go zone, yeah. full stop. Mm. I would like to see us working together with progressive African parties and not just political parties. Sure but organizations, civil society structures, churches, broad-based civil society that are progressive and are pro-African unity. Mm, mm, mm. And when I say us, I mean those of us in the African National Congress who continue to be committed to the full liberation of this country, also that radical economic, economic uh, policy program that I've just articulated. Yeah. I would like us to work together to unite in order to change this country. And also those who are the true members of the ANC, because I want to say this without holding back. Sure. There's no factionalism in the ANC. There's no two equal factions. There are those who are the true believers in the liberation struggle, who have kept themselves true to the historical task of the ANC. And there are those, on the other hand, who were infiltrators, who sold out, who became the agents of white monopoly capitalism. That's not a factional fight. Mm. It is a fight between sellouts and those who are committed to the full liberation in this country. And those of us who are in the ANC, what I call the true African National Congress, committed to the African claims, committed to the Freedom Charter, committed to the policies for radical economic transformation, together with all other progressive Africans in this country, mm. must work together. We must form a united force in order to be able to change this country and once and for all get rid of this strangle grip that white monopoly capitalism so wrongly and so unacceptably continues to hold over our country. You never answered the, um, what you think about EFF. Or Julius. Oh, I, I, I include the EFF. Mm. What do you think about Julius? In the, wait, uh, I include the EFF as part of the progressive African forces in this country. Okay, got you. So I believe that it should be possible for us to work with the economic freedom fighters. Mm. And that, of course, also includes the president of the EFF, the commander-in-chief of the EFF, Julius Malema. I am deeply regretful that when President Zuma wanted to do the transformation policy around land, when he wanted to do expropriation of land without compensation, and 
he made the proposal to reach out to the EFF and work together with the EFF in order to secure the two-thirds majority in Parliament which would make it possible to achieve that. That there were the others in the ANC, the Ramaphosas, the Anacoms and those who scuppered that proposal by President Jacob Zuma. But didn't Zuma get rid of Julius? Well, you know what happened there. Yes, there was a problem between President Zuma and Julius. I believe that that was blown up. I believe it was intensified also by Ramaphosa and Hanako. And that led eventually to Julius being removed from the ANC. Mm. I still believe, and I do not keep President um, Jacob Zuma responsible for it, but I believe the ANC in general made a fundamental mistake in the manner in which they dealt with that issue. And Julius Malema and those who were with him who were the core of the ANC Youth League should have remained inside the African National Congress. And if there's any way to make it possible to work together with them and to work in this broad force of united African progressive structures to achieve what I have said is the real liberation mm. ideal. Mm. We must do so. And that should include the EFF and that should include also Julius Malema. Uh, Penduka, you got a question? Yeah, man. Carl, what are your political ambitions? You know, when you look at yourself in the mirror, what do you desire for yourself politically in the political sphere? I want to see full liberation in South Africa. No, no, for yourself. No, like... no, no, you can't separate the two, so. I have, I've told you early on, I joined the ANC when I was 19. I lived my whole life in the liberation struggle. So my individual ambition can never be separated from my ambition for full liberation in South Africa. What do I want to do individually? I've got a few years left. I'm 62. I'm not a youngster. I would like to be able to make that contribution to see this full liberation being achieved. What we call in African National Congress language, the second phase of the National Democratic Revolution to be implemented. And yes, of course, that means that I'm making myself available as a member, a possible candidate for the national executive of the ANC. I'm standing. Ah, okay. So I want to go into the NEC, but I do not just want to go there for self-aggrandizement. Mm. I want to go there to fight for these ideals mm. that I believe in, that I joined the ANC for, that I went to jail for. You know, as I'm sitting here today, I can show you. I wear hearing aids. Hearing okay. aids. When I take this hearing aid out of my ear, I can't hear you. Mm. I see your lips moving behind that mic, Jeez. but I can't hear you. Mm. I have to put oh, it back man. in. I've lost over 67% of my hearing because of torture Wait, do you, do you, do you keep when I was in detention. Do you keep it in bed? No, no, of course, eventually I have to take them out. Now I know where you're going. <laughs> I can see you <laughs> as you come around the corner. And you got to hear, worry, man. Don't worry, yeah, man. Don't worry. I first ask before I take them out. <laughs> so I get the answer, it's okay. Yeah. Then we proceed. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, the, the serious thing yes, is, yes, yes. I suffered because of this commitment. Yes, yes, yes. And you if you ask me what I want to do now, I want to see that commitment become a reality. Mm. You've literally sacrificed your whole life. Yeah. You went against your parents, your church, your school, your peers, your, your Africana community. Like, it's crazy, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm, I don't regret any of it. Mm. Mm. If I was given a chance to redo it again, I will do it again. Is it true that the, the comrades once thought you were an apartheid spy? <laughs> I'm going to show you my shoe. Yeah. Now, this one, it's not so shiny yeah, yeah. because of the leather. Yeah. But I grew up in a, you know, Afrikaans home. My dad yeah. would say to me in the evening before we go to bed, you must take your school shoes, you must go outside, you polish them. Mm. And you know, it was a special process of polishing. Mm. 
you take, you spit on the nose of the shoe and you shine it. You use some uh, newspaper to shine it. Yeah. So that's what I, I, even now I shine my shoes. So when I eventually went to Witz, because that's part of what I didn't tell you, I went to the University of Witz later on. Sure. After I was expelled from Rao and yeah. after I went through many of the things I told you about. So here I am with my shiny shoes. Ne? Mm. And I'm an Afrikaner boy. Mm. Those days I didn't speak English as well as I do now. I still speak English with the rolling R. Yeah, because I'm broken. Afrikaner. Yeah, yeah. Ne? But so these Wits, white lefties, those students from Newsas. They would look at those shoes, uh, start gossiping. They say, no, man, that, must, that is a policeman. Mm. Only a policeman's shoes look <laughs> like that, shined like that. So, yes, obviously, naturally. You said that all to say yes. No, uh, listen, naturally, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> eh? You're laughing. <laughs> naturally, people would suspect hey, someone God. like me yeah. of being a spy. Yeah, yeah. But, of course, the funny thing is I was never a spy. Mm, mm. And others who were supposedly fitting the bill of being big liberation heroes, ended up being spies. How long did it take? Like, what happened for them to say, ah, no, you're one of us? I don't know. Maybe I, the prison? Maybe prison? I continued to just live my life. Mm. And I continued to, you know, act on my convictions. Mm. And I think eventually people saw who I am and what I stand for. And that's all I can do. I, I can't go around demanding from people to believe in me. I can just be myself and then they must make up their own minds what they think. I got another question, sir. Yeah, man. Do you take Tuduzane's ambitions of being of running for presidency serious? He says it's no joke mm. and I only see it on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> like, look, no one seems to be taking it serious <laughs> if you honest. Tuduzane has got the right to have ambitions to become president or have any position in the ANC like anyone else. Yeah. And then, of course, it is the membership of the ANC who will ultimately decide whether they are going to accept those ambitions and empower that person with those ambitions to become whatever position that person wants. So I can't, I can't denounce anyone for having an ambition but ultimately, all of us, and that includes myself, I just told you that I have the ambition to return to the NEC or the ANC. I was a member of the NEC yeah. a couple of years ago. I have that ambition, but I can't force myself in there. It's an ambition that must finally be legitimized by a democratic process and a vote by the members of the ANC. So then, as a member, would you vote for Itu Duzani Zuma to be presidency? I'm asking Carl, not, you know, the spokesperson. No, no. You, you ask Carl, who's a member of the African National Congress. Carl, who's a member of the ANC, is not going to pronounce about the names of individuals while branches of the ANC, and I'm not playing politics, I'm very straightforward <laughs> with you, yeah. are not going to pronounce about names at a time when the branches are still busy taking the vote. I've criticized others for doing that, I can't be disingenuous and dishonest and then do the same. So I can't answer your question. Not okay, because cool. I want to avoid it, but because it would be wrong of me to answer that question. I think it's time for you guys to just step aside, man. Sail into the sunset and let us young people run this country, man. But You've done enough. I mean, come on, guys. But don't you think... I hear you, and I agree that young people need to play a much bigger role in South Africa and in the body politic of South Africa. But surely there should be a generational mix. Because yes, young people should play an increasingly important role, but at the same time, don't undermine experience. Mm. There must be a combination of experience and the exuberance and also the radicalism that comes with youth. I want to tell you a last story about myself. When I was very young, yeah. I was arrested 1983. So I'm detained, I'm angry, I've been thrown in prison, uh, solitary confinement for over, uh, almost eight, nine months. Now I'm appearing in court. And the prosecutor says to me, 
So, young man, are you going to continue to fight apartheid? I said, yes. Mm. He said, so, young man, if you get a chance, will you plant more bombs? I said, yes. Mm. Then he comes with the final question which he believed he was going to destroy me with. He said, so, young man, if you get a chance, will you kill the president, Mr. P.W. Buita? Mm. I said, yes. Mm -hmm. The judge said, you better check what you're saying. Because if you keep on talking like that, remember you are charged with high treason. I may decide to hang you. Mm. I said, suit yourself, Your Honor. It's in the court record. I'm not blowing my own horn. Mm. But what I'm saying to you is when you're young, you have the courage yes. of youth to sometimes say these things that needs to be said. Yes. And that's why young people are so critical and must play an increasingly big role in our country. That's why the most important periods of radical intensification of the struggle in the ANC always came from young people. One of the most important dates in the history of the African National Congress was 1948, when the ANC Youth League was formed and Anton Lembede became the first president mm. of the ANC Youth League. We forget that the leaders who led the ANC to this point where we saw liberation, at least from racism, in 1994 and the elections of the 27th of April. And I say deliberately, at least from racism, because as you know, I don't believe we got economic liberation. Mm. But those leaders like Oliver Tambo, mm. Walter Suzulu, Nelson Mandela, they were all the products of the ANC youth. Oh, I see. Yes. So youth must be nurtured. And one of the big tragedies that we face in the ANC today is that the African National Congress Youth League is in tatters. I don't even know who's president. Who's the president of the Youth League? I don't well, know. There's a national task team, so there's no president at this stage. Uh. There's an NTT. But my concern is, if we fail to nurture a youth leadership, if we fail to have a strong, vigorous, and well-rooted national, African National Congress Youth League, how are we going to produce the leaders of the future? that will take us forward. How are we going to produce the equivalents of the O.R. Tambos, Nelson Mandela's, and Walter Suzulu's what? that the Youth League of 1948 produced? What do you think those leaders will say now about the current state of the ANC? They will be absolutely devastated. I have no doubt that Comrade O.R. Tambo would be devastated with where the ANC is today and what Cyril Ramaphosa has made of the African National Congress. One of the biggest disasters that befell the ANC was that as we moved from being a banned organization into becoming legal again, and then the negotiations were starting, that Comrade O.R. had those two massive strokes. Hmm. Because it robbed us of his leadership and his wisdom. Because by the time he came back from exile, he was a very ill man mm. and he could no longer play the role that I would have loved him to play. There are those who say they think even those strokes were induced, hmm. but I can't speculate about that. Jeez. The possibility, of course, is there. But the sad thing is that I don't believe that some of the decisions that were taken during the negotiations, even some of those announcements that President Nelson Mandela made that I've referred to during mm. this interview, mm would have been made under the leadership of Comrade Oliver Reginald Tambo. Mm. So we lost a great leader at a critical moment. And those leaders, you ask me what they would think now, they would be outraged by what is being done. Another great leader that we lost, as we've discussed already earlier, was Chris Hani. Mm. And I believe that the loss of Comrade Chris was deliberate. It was a deliberate assassination, and it involved a broad sector of the elite in South Africa, both within white monopoly capitalism, imperialism, and even inside the African National Congress. And I'm sure that Comrade Chris, if he was here today, would have been outraged and would have been a fundamental opponent of what Cyril Ramaphosa and his accurates are doing right now. That's crazy, man. How's the autobiography coming along? Is it still selling? 
How is the autobiography? Yeah, the one he released. <laughs> well, there's the one that was released in 1993. That's yes, that long one. ago. Yeah, that one. It is it's called, called fight, fight for Hope. Fighting for Hope. Fighting for Hope. In Afrikaans om te vech vir hoop. Mm. It's old now. Mm. Uh, it, it was a bestseller. You can't expect it from '93 to become to remain a bestseller. Uh, I saw the out. other day someone said they managing to buy with that autobiography out, now for yeah. for uh, ten rands. Yes, as mm. long as they can can read it. Mm. I've written a second book. It is in its uh, trans. It's 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 in the in in the format where I still need to finalize it. So. It, it, it will be published. I was planning to publish it this year. I think now it will come out next year. Mm. But that's a follow-on on the the one that you refer to. The very thin 130-page autobiography that I wrote then. Well, you couldn't expect a long autobiography from a boy in his mid-30s. Yeah. Perhaps it was even presumptuous of me mm. to have written an autobiography at that stage. Yeah. But okay, I had the presumption of youth to do so. Yeah. Now I'm older, I want to publish my transcript of the new follow-on on autobiography that I've written and the working title that I've given that autobiography is fighting for, not fighting for hope, but Aluta Continua. So it links with fighting for hope. Mm. It means we continue mm. the struggle, we continue the fight. Yeah. We fought for hope, now we continue that struggle. Aluta Continua. And in closing, what do you want to be remembered as, Mr. Carl Niehaus? As a loyal person. For me, the most important thing in life is loyalty. Mm. Has there ever been a time in your life where you're not fighting anyone? Like you just chilled. Uh, well, he's <laughs> <laughs> been fighting Bad. all my life. I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps when I was a little boy. Nah. But I doubt that even because my dad tells, tells me horrible stories about how a boy was trying to bully me and I hit the poor boy that he had to go to a hospital with a, 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 a cracked shoulder. Yeah, yeah. So I think I was a fighter yeah, always. Cool. Uh, I don't like fighting all the time. <clears throat> I love to have more time with my family and my friends. But unfortunately, in this country, at this point, we have no other option. No other play? opportunity but to fight. Did you play rugby or soccer? What did you play? I played rugby. Rugby. Uh, yeah, I was a Bursian. I played, uh, I played loose forward. Mm. Uh, but I love soccer. Yeah, yeah. I follow soccer. But of course, you know, when you grow up with a sport like rugby, yeah. I, can, I can watch soccer on television mm. and I enjoy it. But I can listen to rugby on the radio mm. and I can, can see, yeah. imagine in my mind's eye what's mm. happening on the rugby field. I can't do that with soccer. What's your favorite rugby team? Oh, wow. Shocks. <laughs> I'm going shocks. Uh, I don't have a favorite. Mm. I used to support uh, the Lions. Oh, the Lions. But, you know, the Lions, they, they were limping a little bit. <laughs> so now I don't really have a, a rugby team that, I, that is my favorite. I do have a favorite soccer team. Chiefs. Chiefs. Yes. Ah, my course. Man, you said you were loyal and you stopped supporting a rugby team because <laughs> they were doing badly. <laughs> no, I just stop, I stopped having an interest. I call. I call. I call. That's uh, <laughs> all. I'm loyal in the issues that really matter. <laughs> no, no, no sports matters. Come on, you know. Ah, <laughs> but surely compared to the big issues of politics and human yeah, life, uh, sport is, yeah. sport is uh, something which yeah. we entertain ourselves. Mr. Yeah. Khan, thank you so much for your time, thank man. You. Thank you so much for your wisdom. Hmm. It was really awesome having you here. I didn't know about you until this interview, so I'm glad really? we did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Because uh, it humbles one. <laughs> <laughs> this has been Podcast and Chill. We are here, man. Boom. Welcome to Black Excellence. Do not fear, for if you do, just sip on some grandeur. And if you still do, ask ourselves, what would Mapapunzi do? Parama Chilla. 
itlasha lefiki. Ungo yi, even when they ask you, how sabi in, do not fear. For if you do, just say, Anistiri. This is the medicine of censorship. This is the pill. Which one is that one? Podcast and chill.